Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We had a uh, we had a vicious set of competitions this afternoon, so appreciate everybody being able to log in and compete. Um, we are overwhelmed to be joined with DHS for the last keynote of the day. We have a quick late switch. Um, Director Krebs has been called away, but he has allowed to replace him Assistant Director Bradford Wilkie uh, for stakeholder engagement. Bradford is uh, one of our, our nearest and dearest friends here in the Cyber 912 world um, and has been serving as Assistant Director acting for stakeholder engagement uh, inside of CISA. His role is exactly where many of you have been trying to articulate policy recommendations today. So I'm, I'm excited he can join us. Talking through the agency's strategic relationship formation and management process with stakeholders in the private sector and across government. His team is effectively the front door uh, for folks looking to engage with CISA's capacity building and risk reduction products and services. So I, I hope that you'll get a chance to uh, think up some good questions for him. Rapper's gonna speak for a few minutes. We'll go to questions from the group. And then he, I think, is also gonna have some questions for you. So we'll make this more of a town hall setting rather than a straight keynote. Uh, but with that, and Bradford, thank you again for joining us. Over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Dre. Um, glad to be joined by everybody. Um, this, is a, this is great. I know I'm in the middle of your two-day virtual competition. It's fantastic. Um, one of the things we kind of talked about was, you know, lots of real-world issues going on right now. I want to uh, back up a little bit. Uh, to the easier, calmer parts of the year when we were doing just uh, looking at things like the Iran tensions, uh, January 3rd, uh, we were staring sort of blissfully ahead um, on things like uh, the census coming up and, and out, out and about now, and then certainly looking at the, uh, the ever, uh, you know, the, the ever sort of bloom, uh, I would say evergreen issues around um, uh, the elections 2020 protect 2020. So um, let me, I, I want to kind of, kind of work through what Trey said, which is what is CISA doing and how is it structured to operate with partners, with critical infrastructure, with state and local government. Uh, and then, you know, ho hopefully that'll give you a little bit of insight into uh, what we're doing as this cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. Um, I know some of you have heard or seen uh, my director, Christopher Krebs, talk before about the CISA as the nation's risk advisor. And I think one of the other things we like to say is that we, we really, it, it is a, it is a cybersecurity is a team sport these days. Uh, and it's a, it's a crowdsourced, uh, you know, set of solution space and answers that we have to a lot of policy questions and even operations today, quite frankly. So I'm going to give you a couple of vignettes. Um, you know, Trey's going to give me the the uh, hook, if you will, to to get me to move on into your questions. But I'm um, I'm thrilled to be here to to talk with you and kind of get you a look under the hood from the things that we face. Um, going back to January second, uh, you know, a, a, a making a military strike in a in a far off uh, you know country killing a, uh, a military general of another foreign uh, nation's military, you know, probably wasn't on the risk calculus of many of business and industry and state and local government in the United States. Uh, and certainly, you know, what first looks like a military action um, can easily have blowback, uh, as, as you know, to uh, certainly things that happen in the physical realm. But I think what we re recognize waking up on January 3rd is that when uh, General Soleimani was, you know, assassinated and, and, and targeted in Iraq uh, as Iran's top general of the Qud forces, that something was going to be different, uh, that Iran didn't have necessarily the military power to go head to head with military forces, and that they would try to use a series of proxy actors, sympathetic actors, uh, and even their own military to reach beyond the sort of kinetic and physical environment into uh, certainly the cyber space uh, realm and, and, and would actually probably not uh, work to um, strike back against our military weapons platforms and cyber weapons platforms, but actually target industry, uh, state, local government, academia, nonprofits as uh, the soft underbelly or a softer underbelly. 
So that's the scene setting I want you to set up. So if, if we wake up as an infrastructure security and, and a cybersecurity agency on uh, January 3rd, like we did, what does that mean from the work that CISA does on a day-to-day -day, um, perspective? And I, I'd like you to break it down to a couple lines of effort that will give you some insight into what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, the first thing is, if we're going to be the nation's risk advisor, then we have to sort of be on point to say uh, that the, the calculus of understanding the risk yesterday has, has, uh, has been necessarily run over again. And, uh, and, and what we found is today's picture of risk is not yesterday's. And so what we did was quickly say that, uh, you know, kind of what I walked you through in the scene setting, which is Iran is not likely to strike back military to military. Um, it's certainly not going to be, you know, we want to understand what proportionality means in this space. And so if they don't strike back uh, in a symmetric way, what does asymmetry look like? And so we instantly wanted to put our business partners in industry, our critical infrastructure partners in, uh, you know, electricity delivery and critical manufacturing and finance. We wanted to put their, their radar up and we wanted to put their shields up. And so we went out with a couple early products called CISA Insights. And these were documents that basically said, um, you know, in its, in its method of operations and the way it chooses to display uh, retaliation in this case, um, it may not be physical, kinetic on kinetic. It might likely be cyber. Um, it is not going to be cyber in terms of they're not going to ransomware us to death. Uh, which is certainly a, uh, a capability of theirs. It's in their arsenal. Uh, they're likely to use the access that they have or the access they can go find in uh, American businesses, local government, and our partners. And they're likely um, to do a couple things. One is uh, first strike back with the uh, low-hanging fruit. Those are things like website defacements, denial of service attacks, and, and again, you know, they would probably use proxy actors, uh, sympathetic cyber actors to demonstrate that capability in uh, near real time and, and as a retaliation. And so you saw that. You saw the um, federal, uh, there was a federal site, a library system, uh, there was an FDIC site uh, that were taken offline and basically uh, the websites were defaced, right? That's a Pretty easy thing to do these days. It's been going on for a good 20, 25 years. Um, we've had websites for 30 something years. So, you know, defacements have happened just as long. Uh, the other thing that we saw was that uh, when they got serious, they were probably going to exploit the access that they had to do uh, destructive malware campaigns. So, they, again, Ransomware makes you pay them, uh, but if they have access to get ransomware on your system or on a network or on a business, uh, they have necessarily the permissions to make a broader strike at the company, uh, destroying information, not just locking it up and holding it for ransom. And so we fully expected that they would be, uh, retro, you know, uh, take retribution, if you will, on, on American businesses. Um, some other things changed as well. Uh, we expected, you know, that they had demonstrated some things in the past, like denial of service attacks uh, that were certainly crushing in, in the uh, early 2010s, if you will, um, to, to demonstrate things uh, against the financial services sector. You know, if you remember, uh, there were banks that were down for a number of days that had denial of service attacks against the, the, their web pages, their web uh, uh, web payment systems and certainly web banking. Uh, and while that isn't, you know, didn't really work against the core financial systems and the market systems of the nation, um, it took down some customer and consumer confidence, if you will. And so the public, when they see um, government web pages defaced versus government web pages and, and businesses being denied access to be a denial of service, it really causes um, shakes in, in public confidence and trust in government. So, you know, that's, that's a landscape we were thinking about as well. Um, probably the other thing to think about with uh, Iran was we may be seeing uh, what their intentionality capabilities are. We may be looking at exquisite, um, you know, sophisticated, intelligent sources that tell us where they're going to go next. 
But if we can't pivot that very gracefully and easily to industry and get industry to tell us about um, what they're reading as different signals against their networks uh, today versus yesterday, meaning how that how companies have postured their defenses needed to change, but it wasn't instructive enough just to say, hey, they may strike back with ransomware, denial of service, um, you know, destructive malware or defacements. We had to be able to give them the targeting packages that uh, Iran would necessarily use and has used in the past. And so that really means, that really kind of operationalizes. I think that, that goes to where CISA, once we sort of you know, do the risk advisement stuff, we've got to push out a chair that allows industry to work with us shoulder to shoulder. And I think that's exactly what we tried to demonstrate. By, by Monday, the 7th of January, uh, my group had stood up an engagement working group and had basically pushed the chair out for industry, industry um, represented by sector coordinating councils, uh, the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, the National Council of ISACs. These are the people who are going to have um, operational charge of making sure that business and industry actually raises shields, works with government to identify the new threat information and the, the new information on the ground that they're seeing. If you think about it, right, we, we keep uh, holding out this cliche of uh, private sector really holds 85% of critical infrastructure operations uh, in, in terms of their skin in the game. What that really requires on us is a coordinated and proportional way to raise defenses, uh, chase signal from noise, share information and best practices, not just the threat intelligence, but actually what's working. And we expected a couple things that we needed to work out with industry. One was what changed from the normal behavior that you see in threat actors associated with Iran uh, from yesterday to today. And that works both ways. Both do you see things increase, uh, increase traffic where maybe Iranian uh, cyber threat actors are reaching out and, and testing their continued ability to have access onto networks. So, you know, persistent access or APT kind of behaviors. Or did you actually see a drop, meaning, uh, if you saw a drop of connections from uh, threat actors associated with Iran, that could mean that they're pulling back and looking for maximum strike. And, you know, it's not different than what we would do out of the, the, the government perspective here. If somebody struck us, we would take that back to the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense working with the Joint Chiefs would probably talk to the National Security Council you know, the White House would be involved and we would be looking at counter-strike and what proportionality means. So imagine that on Iran's side where they're looking at their own National Security Council and looking at what retaliation really means. That actually has a measurable effect sometimes. And you can, you can see sort of, um, you know, the, the, actor's capability, uh, the actor's actual activity lower or uh, rise against the policy planning and the policy discussions that they're having. Um, and so we needed industry to tell us where they were seeing those kind of drop offs and those increases. Um, probably the other, the, the last thing on Iran, I think it's just a, it's a use, usable thing because it's really a real time policy kind of challenge for us uh, is, you know, what does full retaliation really mean? So, you know, did they, did they get everything they wanted out of proportional response? Um, are they still waiting and buying their time? Is, you know, is COVID a good excuse for them to kick us while we're all down? That is, while everybody is suffering from the pandemic. Not saying they would have a strike capability, but I think we're still in that window where we kind of said, uh, this may be the first thing that we measure, some defacements. They may be uh, striking back against certain industries, um, but we probably need to play this out for eight to 12 weeks. Guess what? We're still in that window of time. We're still nearly 12 to 14 weeks out from those moments. And I think we, uh, we still need to have a cadence with industry. Um, kind of uh, another thought, I'm going to just pivot to another quick example of where we really try to stitch together uh, industry's view on cyber policy and operational challenges. And this actually happened uh, almost a year to the date before uh, this January in the Iran situation. In January of 2019, 
um, when the federal government was really um, also shaken by some of the furlough of uh, agencies like the Department of Homeland Security and my agency, CISA, uh, what we saw as I sent folks home was some interesting global DNS tampering. And so, you know, if you're familiar with the domain name service and the kind of fabric of the internet that it helps support, uh, name resolution, you know, IP addresses, um, and certainly uh, the, the registrant information it provides for industries as well as countries, what we saw were some very um, interesting things that caused us some concern for uh, trust in the fabric of the internet. And so let me, let me quickly describe what we saw and why industry and government working together, and I, I do not mean the lip service of public-private partnership, I mean the operationalizing of partnership, truly. Uh, here, here's what we saw. Uh, we saw uh, country top-level uh, domain country codes being manipulated. So if you were trying to go to a Ministry of Interior or a Secretary of State office in a, a Middle Eastern country, uh, you were likely being redirected because the country code domain services were pointing you to a new set of IP addresses. So that's sort of leg one of the situation is somebody had compromised uh, authoritative domain name services and registrants, uh, you know, through either um, credential hacking on the registrant or the, reg uh, the registry. So that means if I'm... Um, GoDaddy.com, and I'm holding out, uh, you, you know, domain space for sale. Yes, we pro we saw some uh, credential hacking on the side of the 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 um, uh, the, the registrant. Um, we also saw uh, credential hacking on the actual owner of the domain space, and so somebody who was trying to protect their Ministry of Security or Ministry of Interior, which is a Secretary of State's office or uh, Ministry of State Security, if you will. Uh, we saw the owners of that space have their credentials actually hacked as well. So that was leg one. You can't trust uh, where your, uh, what your namespace is doing. Uh, working hand in hand with that is point two, which is where you were redirected to if you were going to a uh, Middle Eastern Department of State was actually to a uh, virtual private server hosting company. So a, a, a company you know, like an Amazon, like a packet clearinghouse, like others that actually allow you to rent uh, servers and establish, you know, email servers for web pages, transactions, you name it. But, you know, um, renting infrastructure as a service, basically, right? So, you know, very, very common. I mean, these are what cloud environments and, and platform as a service, infrastructure as a service really is these days. And it's very, very easy for me to rent a couple servers, throw up a website, throw up an email server, uh, a domain name server to resolve. And, and that's sort of leg of uh, the second leg, which is, um, you know, if I'm, let's just, let's just take an example here. If I'm the country of Qatar uh, or Saudi Arabia, and I expect people to go to uh, uh, the, uh, are, you know, resolve uh, to a server in my country, I would expect the domain name services uh, to be something that I want pointed at, and I would expect the servers, the servers to be mine. And so the first two legs of this stool, again, were compromise of the domain name state space and then compromise of the servers that really didn't reflect that company, in this case, that country. Uh, the third part of that three-legged stool is the trust condition. So if you imagine, nobody should be really able to do this, um, but if they do it, they shouldn't be, they should be outed because uh, things like uh, trust certificates, um, you know, certificate authorities that issue uh, TLS and SSL certificates, you should be able to see that you're not really going to the website or the domain that you intended. Uh, well, the bad guys had manipulated um, the certificate environment as well, and they had issued certificates in the name of those countries' servers and had put them out there for uh, use in the web of trust. And so, you know, for example, if I'm sending diplomatic cables uh, between two email servers from, let's say, the United States and Saudi Arabia, all of a sudden, it's not going from the United States Department of State to Saudi Arabia uh, over email. It's going to bad guys rented server with a locked certificate that says that there's a trust condition 
because the DNS information has been hijacked uh, or at least tampered with. So here's what we needed. We needed one, uh, this is where industry comes into it. One, we needed to understand whether other portions of industry that were hosting domain spaces, um, setting up and being registrants, they were hosting uh, server farms, uh, they, were in, they were issuing certificates, uh, trust certificates and, and uh, SSL certificates. We needed to ask them, is this what you're, we're truly seeing at this scale? Is there more to it than, than we're seeing? And is this the tip of the iceberg or is this exactly the space in which we understand is challenged? And if you imagine that, that is a, that is a question that should be a query. If you're a, an authoritative regime, you can answer that question. But if you're, if you're in public-private partnership, you need to go out to certificate authorities. You need to go out to virtual private server and hosting companies. You need to go out to DNS registrant companies and you need to in inquire with them and ask them what they've seen in, in this window of time. And so we went out, created those partnerships where we didn't have them, read them into the situation, gave them the technical information to chase down about what we were seeing, um, brought the law enforcement piece in there to uh, actually explain who we thought was behind this because a lot of that goes into how you chase down uh, these questions. And then I think we got some serious policy questions to deal with out of this, right? Um, do, does, the, does, the, uh, uh, you know, does government need to be more, have a hand in domain name registration for country codes? I think that's something that we gave up uh, a number um, of uh, about a year or two ago where, you know, we do not, the government um, does not really sit on top of the authority of how names and name services are handed out globally. Um, it's a consortium of the private sector uh, and generally agreed through standards bodies. And is that enough insight to do that? Um, you know, can we as government work with industry to improve basic hygiene practices uh, that are executed near the fabric of the internet. So routing, BGP kind of effects, DNS tampering kind of effects. Is there a policy answer uh, that would lead its way to best practice and, and I would say high performance? Uh, and one of the things we did is we recognized that we could lead by example. Uh, the federal government in the United States has 99 uh, departments and agencies that are pretty large. Uh, we've got a large .gov landscape that we don't want to see USA.gov or WhiteHouse.gov or CISA.gov tampered with uh, that would deny us our email, that would redirect our traffic, uh, that would pretend to be us. And so we needed to be the first one to sort of drink our own Kool-Aid for what good looked like. And so we used a policy authority we have to declare emergency directives for the federal space and within probably uh, two or three days of that, we basically said um, the hygiene by which government manages its domain space is not good enough. Um, you will go out and implement things like multi-factor authentication on domain registrant information uh, so that people can't tamper with that. And um, and I think, again, you know, it, it, it took quite a kind of government learning from industry what best practice was and kind of having that dialogue. So let me, let me wrap up here and say that, you know, whether it's, uh, it's Iran, it's um, looking at Kaspersky and Huawei as trusted in the fabric of the U.S. kind of ecosystem of information communications technology, or it's something like this DNS tampering. So this is one where it recognizes you know, government is not always a leader. Sometimes we have to listen to industry about what the best practices are. And honestly, um, government can learn a lot if it pushes out the chair for industry and really gets a tight coordination there, both on a policy front, as you're seeing and probably reading in the, the Cyber Solarium uh, Commission's report, as well as an operational front. Uh, and so, you know, we can talk about those with you. I, I think you all have been... Um, you know, engaged in what cyber policy really means. It's, it's really hard to draw geopolitical boundaries around cyber policy these days. Uh, so we could certainly talk about cyber uh, warfare and doctrine. Not an expert on that, but I've read all the uh, nice memos on that stuff. Uh, but, you know, to me, uh, there are real pressing issues that get solved, um, not because of the operations, but because of the policy misalignments that we have with industry, 
uh, with uh, our academic sector. Um, and I don't mean um, just issuing, you know, what all the students are going through right now in terms of closed campuses, but I, I mean really defending research and engineering that's happening in our university structure uh, against places like China. So we can talk all afternoon if you want. I know uh, Will's gonna cut me off, Trey's gonna cut me off, but would love to hear from some of the students about what you guys are tackling and what questions you might have for an agency like CISA. Yeah, Bradford, I'll, uh, I'll just read a couple of these questions that have come through. Well, first of all, thank you, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, read out a couple of these questions that have come through for the Q&A. Uh, first, um, did the, uh, the TLDs that you were discussing earlier have DNSSEC enabled, or was that compromised in some way as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so DNSSEC wasn't, wasn't something, and, and again, you know, DNSSEC, only works, this is a, a protocol that works between DNS servers to kind of say, am I an authoritative server talking from A to B in sort of a web of trust? Um, but if I can compromise certificates and set up and pretend to be somebody else's uh, DNS server using DNSSEC, and I can do that in the time frame that makes other people not uh, pay attention to what I've done to manipulate it, you can still get around DNSSEC, but in this case, yeah, we didn't, we didn't see a lot of good practices like DNSSEC uh, would have prevented here. I think what we saw was a need to um, understand who was issuing certificates for DNS servers uh, to lock those in from point to point, and, and how, this is an interesting side effect, I'll move on in a second here. People were issuing those certificates. They would stand up and say, I'm, I'm just gonna make, a, make something up. Um, I'm Saudi.gov, whatever. Uh, and this is where you can find me on the web, my IP address to, to name resolution. Here's my certificate. Uh, they would set up infrastructure, establish that uh, TLS certificate. They would put it out there and post it. They would capture these uh, email and, and message traffic coming in, and then they would actually tear it down and they would tear it down at a cycle rate below 24 hours so that if I was Saudi Arabia, I wouldn't even know that a, a certificate was issued on my behalf. I wouldn't see it because the 24 hour cycle that people generally look at certificates, uh, they were, they were um, it was a race condition. They were basically beating the clock on things that we couldn't see. Great, uh, we'll move on to the next one. Um, how mu how do, much does CISA uh, rely on their partnerships with private industry to standardize mitigation techniques across industry, uh, specifically ICS, and how does CISA, com uh, CISA communicate with these companies? Yeah, uh, incredibly big. I, if you've ever heard the director talking about um, operations technology and ICS, it's one of his number, uh, it, it's one of his top five priorities for, uh, for as long as he's gonna be at the helm and probably uh, a CISA priority for a long time after that. I'll just say that, you know, we have always had good collaboration with national labs. They are able to give us things like test beds and simulators at scale, but it's the private sector, you know, tools and, you know, I would say toys, but really the, the tools and the vendor systems that are really in those environments. Um, and we can't move forward, I think, unless we have a couple of good components here with ICS vendors and manufacturers and integrators. And that is they've got to produce good products and secure products. So secure coding, secure firmware, secure OT, they can only do that if they're with somebody who is going to red team, is going to look at secure architecture, is going to look at secure coding. And I think it's going to take, a, it takes a collaboration to do that. So what we're doing is we're asking them to let us into their engineering kind of development, work with them on secure engineering practices and that really takes lots of trust because again, they've got a product they're trying to get to market and they're trying to let the government in to help them do assurance. Um, that's a big trust condition, but a lot of, a lot of uh, OT, ICS vendors and manufacturers are absolutely happy to do that because the reverse is true too. When you're, when you're Microsoft and you're very big and you start to corner a market, uh, and then you've got millions of lines of code, you find out that you've got to go into this continuing patch process where you're, you're fixing and fixing and fixing. And I think what they want to do is make it secure by design. And so that, that's, a, that's only a partnership that can be crowdsourced. Great. Um, thanks for that answer. Uh, another question from uh, Carlin Williams. Uh, what are your thoughts on the synergy between governors utilizing the National Guard for domestic cyber with, with CISA's federal role? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm all for the National Guard uh, in 
in a number of spaces here. One, um, they do training and exercise and assessments at a scale that we just can't do. Um, I, we have, you know, uh, about 28 cybersecurity advisors that are really our frontline service delivery people. They, they provide excellent customer service. They deliver exercises, training and exercises. Imagine if I could call up an auxiliary of National Guard that's trained on the same assessments, training and exercise platforms that we have and get them to roll out in mass to really work on the preparedness and protection side of things. I think the tension here has always not been, is the guard useful for response, recovery, and sort of, you know, uh, surging right of boom. It's, you know, it's the thornier questions of, you know, who pays for it? What does the standard training look like? Are you peeing, uh, uh, stealing from Peter to pay Paul? And so the, the analogy there is, if, if critical infrastructure, like right now, let's say COVID environment was actually mass computer viruses out there instead of an actual pandemic virus, and you ask the National Guard to step away from where they usually work, which is industry, to help private industry, you're basically saying that we're going to uh, take from those who need defenders to those who have priority for being defended. And so it, it doesn't, that's a great policy challenge to figure out, like, who gets priority restoration? Who gets the first responder uh, from National Guard? How do we really work that at scale for massive attacks that might be uh, might be out there and leveraged? You know, the sort of the cyber nine one one kind of stuff nine one two. You know, so my my point is um, great question. I think we're also learning about how to pay. Who can order? Do they snap up to the president's level? Are they working under? Uh, the governor's direction. I really liked what uh, Governor John Bell Edwards did in last August uh, as students were returning to school, but teachers had uh, seven of their school districts ransomware in, that, uh, in, in Louisiana. And basically he was saying, it doesn't matter whether National Guard or the Cajun Navy, his words, not mine, um, but it, it is going to take a, a slew of resources to rebuild 20,000 machines in 10 days so that we can return students and faculty back to the classroom by mid-August. Uh, mid to me, that's a perfect example where the National Guard scales and uh, CISA and other organizations do not. And I would want to say that uh, you're going to see the same thing play out here in uh, coronavirus land where if we do have cyber effects, it's going to take the community uh, auxiliary and National Guard to really surge and rebuild uh, and, and provide community assistance and resilience. Okay, we'll, we'll take one or two more. Um, from Ryan Cunningham, uh, with Iran seemingly overwhelmed by COVID-19, uh, have we seen the attacks that you were discussing earlier diminish at all? Uh, you know, so we're seeing some interesting stuff in healthcare right now. I won't go into too great a detail. Um, but we're seeing some uh, interesting things where people are really targeting uh, VPN insecurity. There's a, been a lot of um, uh, Pulse VPN. That was a big uh, patch and, and issue with that last year. Uh, you know, Citrix has had some uh, vulnerabilities to it that you've probably been tracking. You know, the bad guys know this too, and they know number you know number uh, number one that you know those vulnerabilities existed. Now they know that uh, nearly 100% of some workforces are coming in through VPNs or Citrix or thin clients. So we are seeing increases on those, and we're trying to make sure that there is a cyber safe uh, workforce out there of end users. And again, like I kind of mentioned in my uh, early comments, it, you know, COVID or maybe I didn't say this, COVID is shifting the way in which we're working as a nation. And this telenation that we have is changing also where the defenders need to put their uh, time and attention, which is really at those VPN, the Citrix environments, as people come in through remote access. So we're seeing a shift of adversaries to that. I can't say Iran is doing that. I think there's a whole slew of bad guys who are out uh, on that end of things. Um, to, uh, to follow up on the, the COVID line of questioning, um, with COVID-19 shutting down large swaths of the US economy, forcing many to telework. Um, how might CISA change the calculus on how DDoS attacks uh, are viewed, particularly targeting you know, medical public health responses um, and uh, HSS at the federal level? Um, and will this, get, will this degrade further if it leads to loss of life directly? Yeah, I'm gonna eat my words on this. Um, so I'm like knocking on my table here right now, but uh, 
DDoS mitigations um, at large scale have been pretty effective. We learned a lot in that 2012-2013 era where banks were targeted. Um, there's a lot of uh, mitigations built in um, and there's a lot of providers out there who can basically slow the rate. Um, you know, there's all the, the multi-peering point kind of solutions. There's backscatter analysis types of things. A lot of operational things really work here. Um, but maybe I'm pick, not, not picking up on the full question. I don't think DDoS is as big as a problem, but you're right. You're very right in that, you know, we are already as a nation in an N minus one condition. The, the hurricane is everywhere. The fire is broken out. This is like Australia with its fires. There is no area of society that is not currently touched by this. And as we go to something that is not a paper-based society and a physical proximity society, society, and we go online more and more and more, what's going to be stressed is last mile internet service providers and telcos because they're, they're going to have bandwidth challenges and DDoS is, it would even further constrain that. But I think our, our medical, our public health, um, and in some cases, the financial services and the comms companies are really watching that space. Um, we have not seen uh, saturation really uh, that concerns us and we haven't seen DDoS. You know, if it happens, um, because I think everybody's staring at this space, the new telework, telenation landscape, we're gonna be on it pretty fast. Not saying there won't be uh, some effects. I don't think there'll be any, any life safety effects right now. I think a lot of people are uh, really focusing on um, you know, five or six nines of availability and putting excess capacity in right now just because the work, the way in which we're working as a nation changed. Um, great. We're actually going to take our last question here. Um, how concerned are you about quantum computers compromising today's internet protocols and encryption standards? Ooh, that's, that's like a $50,000 question. Um, I was going to say that's a 15 minute question and, and definitely very valuable. Yeah, look, uh, you know, to be the, the sci-fi guy in me says quantum will change everything, but I, I think we're not going to wait for quantum to change encryption and monitoring and all of that. I think 5G and software-defined networks are going to give us a different way of pushing uh, security properties and responsibilities out to edge devices, uh, and I think that's going to be the next phase of challenges. The good news is that you know we're doing a lot of work with the private sector again on this space, and I, I'm not overly concerned. I think there are privacy things and public policy that need to be figured out. Look at uh, CCPA, look at New York's privacy law, uh, look at GDPR. I think we do need to pay a lot of attention to privacy that we're not focusing on right now. I think it's happening in small sets uh, through interesting, interesting kind of laws like uh, California CCPA. Um, but I also think that, you know, uh, am I concerned about encryption where bad guys go dark or where law enforcement needs to have act, responsible access after the fact? Uh, you know, I think that um, that's, a, that's a great maybe, uh, if you're not already studying it through your, your policy challenge, that's a great one to kind of work on. Um, I would say look at software-defined networks, and I'll draw you to two very quick things uh, in, in closing at least for me. One is look at what the NSTAC is doing. That's the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Council uh, or committee. And it's been around for 37 years. It really focused on what we call the cyber moonshot and basically said, we need a safe and resilient internet by 2028. And well, great, we're already uh, two years into it. How secure are we if, if ransomware is the uh, problem of the day? But they're doing work on software defined networks. Uh, so that's one. The second one is look at the Solarium Commission because it really is saying that um, while government needs to have a little bit more funding and authority, the private sector needs to be supported by responsible policy as they face these challenges of monitoring of, of quantum, of 5G, of, uh, of uh, encryption. And I think, I think again, it, we're gonna flip this script and make sure that industry has a chair and a seat at the table and is leading us into those policy discussions. Thanks, Trey. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Trey now for a couple of remarks and uh, the announcement of semifinalists. Bradford, thanks for that. It's a, it's a wide ranging discussion and it was useful to think through threats new and old. And um, I think for the, the group here, there's a, there's a recurring challenge in trying to integrate a variety of different threat vectors and risk levels 
levels of certainty and present that all on one page really neat and clean. So I, I appreciate you you kind of walking us through the diversity of threats and issues that you've got to deal with. Uh, all right, so it's that magic time. Um, you guys have had a heck of a day. Before we do anything else, I, I wanna thank again our partners that are making today and, and this program possible, uh, specifically Siemens, MITRE, Facebook, NYU, and MCPA. Um, calling out in particular, uh, Kurt John with Siemens, who's gonna be judging tomorrow. Emily Fry and her team team from MITRE that's been judging all day today. And so Leo Salahuddin from Facebook, who's also been judging today through some technical difficulties. Uh, thank you guys very much for dedicating your time. And thank you to all the judges who spent time with the competitors today. I've, I've been able to jump in on most of the rounds and the conversations have been fantastic. This was not an easy scenario and you guys have, have really taken some big bites out of it. So um, a last note before we announce semifinalists, decision documents for tomorrow will be due at 8.30 a.m. And they're going to Will Loomis at atlanticouncil.org, just like they did for the first round. Okay, without any further ado, the semifinalists for tomorrow are, in no order, AU Cybernauts, Stia Stingers, the Lewis University Flyers, TU Cyber Team, Cyber Space Force, Wolverines, couldn't hack it 2.0, the fighting electrons, Tron Wizards of Woolworth, and rounding it out, still cool with whatever. So thank you to all the teams who competed today. Good luck to those advancing. Congratulations on an incredibly hard fought competition for those that, that had a chance to compete today. We're gonna have um, an email going out to you guys here in the next hour. You'll see calendar invites for the semifinal rounds as well as for everyone at the competition, those three networking sessions tomorrow. For teams that are not advancing, I strongly recommend uh, that you take some time to engage. We're gonna have a couple of folks from MITRE, Winona DeSombre, who is a threat analyst uh, with threat analysis group at Google, really fantastic individual. And then Kurt John himself is gonna be spending some time with you guys, North America Chief Cybersecurity Officer for Siemens during those three sessions. So thank you guys all very much for today, judges, competitors, coaches alike. Um, good luck tomorrow and we'll see you after the sun sets. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to end the meeting now, but uh, if anyone has any issues, technical issues or anything that arise, please feel free to shoot me an email and uh, please have a good day. Thanks, everyone.